doesn't necessarily work in Africa. When I started here, I came with my South African Western mindset about how things work, how meat must be cut, how meat must be preserved, and how a meat factory must be set up. And one of the first things that I've learned is that to take a Western approach will be to import, it's actually not just a Western approach, in Russia they do similar, they do, they, they do it similarly to what we do it, in China they do it the way the West uh, does it. And if we do that, we import Western cost structures into a situation that's uh, not necessarily uh, where it doesn't fit. So for example, what I'm talking about is people rush to the conclusion that the first thing that must be done to address the matter of meat quality is to put up feedlots. So if we put up feedlots in a situation where uh, nomadic uh, animals are used, those nomadic animals have uh, in uh, West Africa, for example, uh, uh, roots in certain tribal communities that's ancient. And the cattle uh, is available in vast quantities. And if we now discard that, so, 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 so when we put up a feedlot, we immediately compete with the uh, migrating cattle, uh, the, mig the, the nomadic cattle trade. And if we do that, we are breeding an animal that is going to be vastly more expensive than the uh, nomadic animals. The reason for the cost is not necessarily only the input cost. It is also the matter of supply and demand because there's enough extremely wealthy people in the area who uh, culturally have a big interest in very expensive animals for religious reasons or for ceremonial reasons or whatever, a son or a daughter gets married or there's a certain festival and those kind of things. It makes sense for in their culture. It shows their devotion to, uh, the, and it shows their status and their level of wealth if they use very expensive animals. So that makes the feedlot animal, place the feedlot animal in a high demand. So just price, or just supply and demand will mean that the feedlot animal is very expensive. Another thing that, uh, one of the first things that I thought when I came here is that we need to bring in some meat breeds. Uh, 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 Bonsmara from South Africa, for example, which is an excellent, probably the best uh, uh, meat animal uh, uh, in Africa. And, uh, but again, to do that, you immediately talk about the 20, 30, 40 year period uh, before that's going to bear any fruit. Because similarly, the same thing will happen as uh, in the uh, feedlot example, that the animals will become very expensive, sought after, and it will always be uh, better to sell that to somebody who comes with, uh, who's prepared to pay a lot more for that animal uh, than compared to somebody uh, paying for one of the uh, local breeds of uh, uh, nomadic animals. So, because of just supply and demand, uh, the feedlot scenario is not, it, it seems like a, uh, like a solution, but it's a red herring. If you're, depending on what is your objective, if your objective is to make meat available, a good meat available at a good price to the average person, then uh, feedlot and uh, even a Western style uh, industrial abattoir is not necessarily the way to go. There's another argument against the uh, Western style uh, abattoir. And that is the inherent cost structure in such a Western-style abattoir. You will never ever be able to compete in one of those abattoir setups with uh, the slab slaughtering that's done in um, across the country. Small from small villages to large cities like Lagos, the, the predominant way that animals are slaughtered is based on the uh, slab uh, slab slaughtering system, where there's no meat trails, where the animal is slaughtered on the ground. There's not even uh, block and tackle with pulleys being used with, with uh, uh, f um, the most rudimentary infrastructure to hoist the animal off the ground. There is another component to this, and that is that there is a fundamental misunderstanding from the Western world side uh, in terms of food safety in West Africa. I've done a, 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 a separate little video on this uh, where I speak about the realization that uh, West Africa is, instead of being primitive, far more sophisticated in terms of its understanding of bacteria uh, than um, uh, the Western world. Uh, uh, and this inherent culture, is based, you know, this, this food safety system, is based on a very simple system of observations. And there's scientific evidence that I'm coming across now from uh, microbiologists who studied this matter, where in the slab slaughtering environment, they don't find pathogens. Uh, I intend to meet with a veterinary doctor who did a, uh, one of her thesis on this exact subject, 
where she couldn't find uh, pathogens in the abattoir scenario when the animals are being slaughtered on the ground. And one of the reasons are very simple for this is that the skin of the animal, as human skins, contains very healthy bacteria. And uh, as long as those colonies of bacteria are large enough, they keep away the um, uh, pathogenic bacteria. So the food inherently are very, very good, the quality. So if we now think that, uh, uh, um, that, that the food safety system in uh, West Africa must be saved, to use that terminology, that is a very wrong mindset. It's not necessarily a Western mindset. Like I said, it can be a Chinese mindset. It can be a Russian mindset, which uh, certainly we won't classify as Western mindset. But that conventional wisdom that's developed is not, it's conventional only in terms of how uh, recently you defined the term conventional. Because like I said, that um, has been the uh, uh, prevailing uh, system in West Africa for I think millennia before uh, we started to develop the food safety system and our, our understanding in the rest of the world. So their system may be the conventional system, and we develop a system, um, a new system, which is not necessarily the best system. So uh, when we think about um, meat production in West Africa, then I think um, to think about uh, a Western-style abattoir in the first place, uh, well, unless, unless your target market, well, what I wanted to say is that is the wrong approach. Uh, as to, to think about the feedlot in the first place is the wrong approach, uh, depending on what is your objective. If your objective is to create a business that's going to supply only the restaurant industry, okay, you know, that may be a, a different scenario uh, where you want to sell uh, Western defined cuts. And um, uh, if you want to sell Western defined cuts, it's easier to get, you, you can get that cuts. One of the uh, inherent uh, buy uh, products of the West Africa uh, system is that the animal is processed warm uh, for, for the large part. Uh, so if you debone a carcass warm or if the procedure as we have it um, in, in your conventional abattoir isn't followed, it's sometimes more difficult to get the recognizable cuts as we are accustomed to in the rest of the world. So if you want to sell a rump steak or a, a T-bone or a, a, a fillet is fairly recognizable, uh, no matter how the animal is uh, killed or whether it's uh, hot or chilled, slaughtered. Uh, the, if that is your objective, yeah, certainly, then it makes sense. If you want to sell uh, uh, cuts in the way that it's sold conventionally in the rest of the world, then it makes sense. If, you, if, if that is your target market and you have a big restaurant, uh, you, you go for the restaurant market, yeah, then it makes sense to uh, maybe invest in uh, big abattoir and in uh, feedlots and those kind of things, and then your price will be will be much higher, much higher, uh, two, three times the price that um, uh, compared to the street markets or what um, can be bought in uh, other retail stores around the country. But if your target market is the average average uh, person on the street, that will be a huge mistake. I I, I don't think it's uh, your your inherent cost structures that you build in will be out. The my West African experience then brought the matter of uh, sausages into uh, perspective for me because I realized I looked at the South African experience where uh, definable meat cuts initially were purely uh, developed or, or we imitated the uh, uh, European and the English uh, systems, German and England mainly, Swiss a little bit, uh, uh, mainly German and English. Um, the, uh, it came, the price was brought about by the tenderness of the meat. So there's a high priority, a premium that's placed on tenderness, as it is, interestingly enough, in West Africa. Uh, myself and a friend who worked with me here could not find any evidence of um, uh, um, West Africans themselves who said that they prefer tough meat. Uh, it's an urban, uh, urban myth that's going around in the uh, expat community in, West, in, in, in Nigeria that says that, oh, they like their meat tough, they want to be chewy and all that type, type of nonsense. There's no evidence of that. The overwhelming evidence suggests that, uh, like the rest of us, West Africans like nice, tender, and juicy meat. Okay, that aside. Um, so, uh, in South Africa, the, um, initially, the assets, probably in the rest of the world, the uh, price of the meat cuts were determined by the tenderness of that meat cut, which then determined the demand for that um, meat cut, which then um, translated into a normal demand and supply. Uh, there's greater demand for it, so the price became more expensive for those. Now, what about the rest of the animal where we don't get such nice tender uh, meat cuts from? So, um, I think from, from that perspective, the sausage industry developed as, um, in other words, as um, meat processing started to develop and uh, there was a bit more attention given to the different cuts. 
and different price systems for the different cuts started to develop. I think that drove the development of the sausage industry because sausage just gives you um, a very nice and tender uh, texture, no matter where that comes from in the animal. Uh, and grinding the meat down, uh, um, what we do in the bulk cutters today or in uh, micro cutters, uh, was done on a, on, a, uh, um, on a stone, with stones, like they would grind uh, maize and corn and uh, in, in, in a mortar and, uh, mortar and pestle type of um, uh, approach. Uh, that was practiced uh, not just around Africa, but in um, Asia uh, as well, and probably in the Americas, probably around the world. And uh, the uh, uh, comminuted uh, um, uh, meat that we have, the emulsions, what we call incorrectly emulsions, um, let's, but let's use that word because everybody use it, knows it. Uh, meat emulsions, your Frankfurter type sausage has developed from that uh, very finely ground meat. And that is the, uh, traditionally was the poorest quality of meat that could be ground up in this way. And um, uh, 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 those uh, Frankfurter type s uh, sausages and uh, bigger, uh, yeah, the, no matter, uh, irrespective loaves we call them today, um, are not necessarily made from uh, inferior meat uh, these days, but traditionally that's where it came from. And that perception to a large extent still exists in the minds of people, uh, that it's inferior quality meat that's used for emulsion-style sausages. But it makes sense that an emulsion-style sausage will follow that, which, which brings me to another point, and that is that um, uh, not just our... Um, uh, uh, the, this drive to first go for abattoirs and then go for uh, feedlots and uh, to be as Western or as uh, Chinese or as Russian in our approach to meat, meat processing, uh, a, a huge mistake. Uh, and I can note that there's many, well, there's actually a few large feedlot operations that um, came into the country, uh, one noticeable, one not noticeable one from Texas, from uh, where there's some, um, a lot of money put behind this project. And it failed. It came to Nigeria and it didn't work because the, 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 economic, the, the, the economics didn't work, the demand and supply didn't work. I think there's some fundamental um, things that people don't um, take into account when they think about these things. Okay, then uh, the, the point that I want to make about the sausages is that now comes into play not just um, a butcher, but also uh, your uh, food technologists, your uh, meat scientists. Because the province of the meat scientist is the extension of meat. So extended meat has become um, into play, not just uh, processed meat, but also um, uh, fresh meat. Because the meat scientist is able to, through various techniques, to tenderize the meat. And so you can get fresh meat uh, that's more um, Western or Chinese or Russian style meat cut in those recognizable cuts, but also very tender from nomadic animals. Right. Then. The same uh, comes in then is the extension of meat, meat, which one of the oldest traditions in terms of the extension of meat comes from uh, the area of Ukraine and um, into Russia, uh, those, the, 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 the Russian steppe, you, you call it, into, into Ukraine around the Black Sea, uh, Turkey, um, uh, uh, Hungary, uh, those nations. Traditionally, and this, uh, I've done a lot of work on this, but there's a good historical reason why the development started in those regions and spread around the world. But meat extension becomes uh, extremely important in the sausage environment. So how do we meet, do meat extensions? Meat extensions uh, became a world business in the, uh, just after the Second World War where the Americans caught onto this and companies like the Griffiths uh, Laboratories uh, brought the uh, soy production into the meat industry. And uh, Uncle Roy Oliver, uh, um, one of the gurus in meat processing, who taught me a lot about meat processing, he uh, was one of the people who was uh, instrumental in bringing uh, soy production into the South African environment. So how do you extend meats? That's a, uh, extended meats. Uh, like I said, it's, it's, more, it's, it's really a Russian uh, system of, uh, and, and the Ukrainian and the Hungarian and, and, and the Polish uh, way of doing things. Uh, but uh, we adopted it in, in America, or it was adopted in America because of uh, meat shortages after the Second World War, and then became mainstream. And uh, there's various uh, materials available that one can use for meat extension. One will be uh, uh, um, plant-based products with high protein sources, and then the other one is, of course, is your starches and those kind of things. 
um, uh, something as simple as breadcrumbs um, uh, became very popular in England and the various things that you can include to extend the meat. But even in, in, in West Africa, there's a very alive and vigorous, uh, they've got their own system of extending meat, which is fascinating, which is a completely different subject. But my point is that, that when you think about uh, um, meat extenders, it becomes a specific discipline. And um, I'm working very closely with some extremely experienced uh, researchers in South Africa in another business uh, with a gentleman called uh, Richard Bosman. So Richard is a, is a meat curing uh, professional and our collaboration started around alternatives to nitrate curing. But uh, Richard is also uh, eager to understand meat extensions uh, very well. And so we gathered around us, around that company, a set of researchers who are absolute phenomenal uh, in, their, in their field. And we, what we are doing is we're looking at every country and taking what is the strength of that country in terms of agriculture, what naturally occurs in that country, and what cheap, and, uh, cheap inexpensive ways can we do to bring that into the uh, province of uh, meat extenders and use that in sausages. And so we want to facilitate that progression then from uh, your uh, only the meat, uh, which you get in the meat cuts and those kind of things, to, uh, a, high, to, to, to a, a meat system that includes plant-based uh, material. And in the old days, that was something that was frowned upon because uh, your, your very uh, uh, old-school English and German butchers and Swiss uh, butchers will frown on something like that. Where in today, where, as it was in, in uh, the driving force, I think, behind this, in, in Russia, where it came uh, from the development of soup technology. And in, in, uh, here in West Africa, similarly, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, had a lot to do with soups. They started including um, uh, vegetables and those kind of things in meat stews. And then they started incorporating that into the comminuted meat, which made sense because they've just used a, a grinding stone to grind down their corn. And now they're grinding down the meat and they saw that the texture looks very much the same. And they saw that when they blend these things together, together from a taste perspective, they actually complement each other. So, so when you think about uh, the uh, a meat factory in Africa, uh, one of the things that you must also think about is that uh, your... Uh, uh, I always say that, that uh, a meat factory is a team of people. It's never just one person. It's never just a butcher or just a meat technologist or uh, just a, a microbiologist. Or uh, It is a team of people. Meat processing is a team sport. And so you must gather all these various disciplines around you because to, to use the one discipline at the exclusion of the other discipline will be a huge mistake. Uh, invariably, we get tunnel vision when we focus on our area of speciality. And so... The, uh, uh, when I think about the opportunities in West Africa, then uh, number one, it will be a mistake to think uh, 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 that the way that it was done in the West and the way it was done in Russia and China and in Vietnam and those places, that is the only right way that, that meat processing should be done. There's a very vibrant culture uh, and tradition from West Africa that we can learn a lot from. And that West African culture extends into Central Africa and into East Africa as well. Then the uh, way that we think about uh, hygiene is uh, we need to rethink uh, that in light of the experiences from West Africa. And we can incorporate some of that thinking. Interestingly enough, there's some of the uh, most advanced food groups in England now who recognizes the value of uh, bacteria, uh, good bacteria, in um, uh, hygiene. And so they're changing their approach to hygiene a little bit. There's some exciting work coming out of uh, England in this regard. And then it is this concept of uh, uh, in, uh, uh, bringing the, um, the, your meat scientists closer, who's able to uh, extend uh, meat, but not just in the traditional way that it was brought over to us by the Griffiths Laboratories. We must understand that uh, Griffiths brought two people to, to, to America and they taught them uh, the way that they believed extension should be done and what was processed in their large uh, uh, soy plants in, in America. It is not necessarily the best way of doing it. In any particular environment in Africa, it may be different. There may be different economies at play. And so we must understand what those economies are and we must bring people on board who can look at it and then can look around the environment and say, I'm going to use A, B, and C and not X, Y, and Z to, uh, to, to do my meat extenders with because we are able to understand the uh, structure of those uh, uh, meat, of, of those plants, and how that complement or not complement the meat. And we are able to develop meat uh, uh, products uh, based on what is locally available, uh, both from the animal side and from the plant side. So... Um, those are some of my thoughts in terms of um, meat processing in Africa. And um, I want to remember that. I want to, uh, what I'll do, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time tomorrow talking about um, 
technologies, uh, of, um, uh, very inexpensive technologies that can be used to achieve the same goal as we do with expensive chemicals and uh, microwave technology and those kind of things, for example, uh, that is available for Africa. And um, I think a careful uh, thought through approach in, in, in Africa is necessary. And uh, I've seen the folly of a Western and a Russian and a, a Eastern approach uh, in this environment. It, it doesn't work. It's, it's, it's uh, you, you in for a hiding second to none. So uh, there's some alternatives I want to put on the table. For today, cheers, guys.